<coughs> Can you go and take a little shot of the ladies' room? Please tell yeah. them. Tell them. Tell them. Where the TV? <coughs> staying together in India. At that time, the country called Tibet, they never had yaks there. Yaks and uh, buffalo, they were staying together in India, but there was shortage of salt. So the two friends, they said to each other that we need salt and we have to find a solution. And they heard that there is salt abundantly available in now uh, in Tibet and somebody has to go there to fetch salt. So the two friends tossed and uh, decided we should go. Neither of them wanted to go but both of them wanted salt. They tossed and the uh, yak lost. So the yak had to go. But then the yak said uh, to Buffalo that I heard that Tibet is a very high altitude and it's very cold there. And uh, why don't you borrow some of your coats to me? And uh, it will be very cold there. And once I get enough uh, amount of salt, I'll bring the salt to India. And finally, uh, the buffalo unwillingly shared his uh, hair with the yak, and the yak, the yak was you know, huge, abundantly and well coated. So he, the yak went to Tibet. The yak found enough soil there, and he liked the altitude, he liked the green pastures in Tibet, he liked the fresh air, he liked the fresh water. And he forgot about his family. <coughs> the buffalo left in India. While the buffalo continued to wait, and that's why even today, the buffaloes, whenever you see, the horn of the uh, buffalo used to be upright, and today has bent. That's all because the, uh, the, the buffalo looked up at the Himalayas, and the horn also sat back. That's why the buffalo do not have enough 
coat on his body, while the yak is thickly coated. And you will see the yak today dancing here. This is a very unique relationship India and Tibet share. In the, um, in the years before the Chinese occupation of Tibet, the Tibetans used to come up to Banaras, Bodh Gaya, for pilgrimage. And Indians used to go right up to Mount Kailash, Manasarovar, for Parikrama, for Darshan. There never was uh, the idea of border. Himalaya was just here and there, and uh, we lived together. There are many, many people all over the whole region of Himalaya, starting from Arunachal, right up to the tip of Ladakh, almost about 4,200 kilometers of border today. Used to be this free region of Himalayan people, of variety of languages, culture. And I see here that we are today a very interesting gathering of such people around here in the audience. I have uh, read much about you. And um, I'm seeing you first time, very beautiful looking. Um, we are very happy that you're here, and uh, especially fr our friend uh, uh, Prabhash Kejriwar, who got us in touch with you. And um, you will see the Tibetan dance for some time. Um, we thank you very much for coming. And uh, now to begin with, I think I must stop talking and do more work. Uh, we will request Madam to come up and uh, light the lamp to inaugurate the festival. From the organizers, uh, we especially want to thank you and uh, uh, our friend Gelega will uh, present a scarf, a traditional uh, scarf. And uh, uh, Mr. Tathagata Chakravarti, who is the coordinator for Friends of Tibet uh, Calcutta, will present a special thank you. Madam uh, would you like to say two words? Friends, friends of Tibet, I really feel quite honored and happy to be here today. Uh, speaking very frankly, I've been traveling quite a bit and I have also come in uh, contact with uh, different cultures, especially cultures of Tibet, Buddhism. It really inspires me from inside and there was a time I'd really done a series on Buddhism and uh, the very fact that the free Tibet is really inspiring. To see people who are together under the same roof today and they want to fight and think alike for a cause and that is to breathe in a free world because that's our fundamental right. So I would again say as an artist, I will think to do something in future about the Friends of Tibet. Thank you. Thank you. Please, 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 please.
other uh, religious aspects of their Tibetan life and the other the politics. And the harmony of religion and politics together run the country of the world. Now Snow Lion is a mythological animal, but some people do claim that it lived in the absolute snow field in the Himalayas. The mythology has today become uh, the psychology of the, of the Tibetan people. There is a belief that snow lions, the snow lions, the milk of it, has a lot of medicinal value and can treat any disease. The, uh, the present Dalai Lama is the 14th one. The 13th Dalai Lama uh, is seen to have seen a snow lion. And uh, this nat uh, national flag, uh, designed in 1912-13, uh, uh, has uh, a lot of influences from the 13th Dalai Lama himself, when Tibet was uh, declared independent in 1913. So we actually see the importance of uh, snow lion in the psychology of the Tibetans.
were uh, you know, completely educated in India and uh, at the same time not losing the dream that there will be a free Tibet as um, our chief guest Priyusa Kar uh, said. This uh, film Escape from Tibet tells you the story of escape route in the world, across the Himalayas on foot. It's an escape route that has operated secretly for 40 years. Tibetan refugees in flight from Chinese repression.
find only in safe. They are walking on the glacier and can suddenly throw up cracks and crevasses. Every year adds to a death toll that has never been counted. Escape from Tibet will continue at high altitude for 120 miles across Nepal until they reach the lowlands. Lob Sang Samten is a monk who escaped to exile here in 1982. He spent 20 years in a Chinese prison during the Maoist era of mass executions. <laughs> In my prison, many died of natural causes, and many were executed. Seven, eight, nine people would be lined up like this. Then they dig a pit. In the pit, there's a spear for each person. Behind them, men point guns at their heads. The main purpose is to shoot them in the head. And when they fall on the spear, they throw earth on top of them. That's what happened. In 1959, during an uprising, 87,000 Tibetans were executed. Many were buried here. These are Lhasa's killing fields. This is day 12 of walking. Their route now takes them through the inhabited area of Nepal. Where there are police, the group must walk by night. It will make the journey more dangerous. Many have traveled vast distances across Tibet, a country the size of Western Europe, before climbing the Himalayas. The escape trail leads many to Kathmandu, only a staging post, before continuing to India and Dharamsala home of the exiled Dalai Lama. The group have walked without a break for 36 hours. Eleven-year-old Tenzin leads the group, battered but intact, into the city. They have spent 30 days on the road. shed. During the monsoon, there is a constant threat of disease. Here is their first meal for many days, and their first opportunity to reflect on their journey, why they left, what might happen to them next. Asai has a place waiting for him in a monastery in India. He wants Tenzin to stay with him. This is the brother's second attempt to escape Tibet. Asai does not exist. 
Western observers estimate that two to three thousand political prisoners, including many children, have passed through here since 1987. There are no beds in the prison. Whether it's summer or winter, you have to sleep on the stone floor. People piss everywhere. We were sleeping in their urine. The food is meant to be noodles, but it is just like water. If you don't drink it, they punish you. The Chinese beat me mercilessly. I was hit on the arm. For three days I was blind. There were many older people, and they beat them severely. There were about 200 prisoners in there. I was sent out breaking rocks while my brother stayed in the prison. I wanted to escape, but I couldn't, because I would have left him behind. The Indian border is 12 hours away.
it's a two uh, it's a um, two string fiddle it's called pivam and uh, there will be other musical instruments uh, gumam which is like a simtur and uh, you have heard that just now in the previous uh, song uh, and then the damyan uh, which is a four uh, six string uh, like a guitar but it will, will look different but um, all of them you will get to see
many religious groups also started coming up. Um, and today, uh, in the art scene, the Tibetans are really um, f flourishing, trying new things. One, they are learning, they are receiving uh, teachings from the elder generation Tibetans. But it is an attempt by Tibetan youngsters to learn the traditional songs, dance, music from the elders and then pass on to the younger generation. And I, I see that this is a, uh, quite a new trend. And, uh, only in uh, 1995 this dance troupe was founded. Um, and there too, just out of uh, some youngsters coming together and uh, f finding common interest coming together and forming this dance troupe. Earlier it used to be five, six people. Now the, the dance troupe is of 30. Siti Masu. Now Siti Masu in Tibetan would mean uh, the enthronement ceremony. Now this is a kind of an old song and a dance sequence. Goes back into 7th century. In 7th century when when the Tibetan Empire was big, and it was really big. Uh, at that time, the Tibetan Empire stretched into China in the east, into Mongolia in the north, and reaching Afghanistan in the west, and, and most of the Himalayan region, they had influences of the Tibetan Empire at that time, in the seventh century. And when the king Songzhen Gambo, the most famous, and powerful Tibetan uh, king when he was enthroned. This is the song that was composed for them at that time.